Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Debbie Kashimani from Bernina of America. I am the sales and product trainer for the company. And uh, we are here today to learn how to sew perfect with your B880. And uh, the first thing we have to do, of course, is we have to go through our housekeeping slides first. So if you have questions for me, please type into the questions box so that we can field some of those at the end and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, this webinar is being recorded and so it will be available for you to watch again on Bernina.com or on YouTube in about a week. If you are using an Apple product, um, you may need to swipe your screen to the right or to the left to see the presentation. And then if you would like the handout for today, it's the three dots at the bottom of your screen where it says more, and then you'll see a handout link that you can download the PDF from there. And if you experience any audio or visual issues once we are into this, then the easiest thing to do is to exit right out, close your internet browser, re relaunch your browser, and then re-enter the webinar, and that should clear up any issues. And then if you have any questions along the way, remember to type them in, and I wanna thank you for being here today. I appreciate your time. I know it's hard to get to everything that you wanna see, but our 880 and sewing on our 880 is super important. So I wanna make sure you have everything you need to uh, be able to do that. So again, reminder, next week, um, look for the recorded webinar under Learn and Create, Classes, Webinars, and Events, Webinars, and Recorded Webinars to find this uh, webinar. So here we are. We're with our 880s, and we are learning how to sew perfectly with them. So this is session two. We did this morning, and we talked about invisible threads and we talked about um, metallic threads and we had a Q&A session at the end. Session two today is on, mostly it's going to be on technical things and um, I think there these are going to be some things that you'll find uh, will help you sew better with your with your machine. So um, technical questions are going to be first, and these are really questions that I received last year when we did our set of four webinars. Um, and then at the end, I just threw in some fun techniques. I'm going to show you some stuff on the simulator so that you understand that there's a lot of fun stuff that can happen if you investigate what's in your machine. So the first thing I want to do is I want to thank um, Alex Ferraro. Uh, he is our um, Director of Technical Services and Support from Bernina of America. He kind of heads up all of the, um, the whole tech side uh, from services to education and, um, you know, managing uh, the support and the answering of questions, all, all of that tech stuff. And he was so helpful to me um, in prepping this webinar so that I could give you um, detailed enough answers that will help you understand what we're going to learn today. So the first question we're going to talk about is that top thread break error message that you see on your 880. And I know you all see it. I do too, right? So we have to understand how this happens, why it happens, and how we can prevent it from happening. So I always said whenever I was uh, training and or even just using a machine for personal use, I you know if that thread break error message would pop up. I would just touch the X at the bottom right and just keep sewing, and it usually was just fine. And so you know the words always came out of my mouth that were like, so there's a sensor in here that I'm somehow triggering, and that's why that's happening. So. I went to Alex and I said, I want to know exactly why this is happening because I want to stop it from happening, right? Not just clear it, but stop it. So here's what I learned. I learned that this happens because the thread that's through your needle and, and your machine is threaded, the thread is loose at the initial sewing. So for example, 
This might happen after you've just threaded the machine, or it might happen after you, you, you've used the thread cutter. And then whenever that happens, the thread is threaded correctly in, internally, but it's not, doesn't have any tautness to it. It's laying on the bed of your machine and it's loose as you begin your, um, your first stitch. So here's what is the fun part of this. This is all about the flag and the check spring. Let me explain. So here we go. The top thread break error message. There is a thread sensor located at the tension unit on the machine. Up underneath, inside, you can't get to it, you can't even see it. But here's a graphic of what it looks like. And I want you to understand the, this purple line that you see is the thread coming between the two tension discs. So the two red pieces, when the tension closes, right, when your presser foot goes down and your tension closes, will put pressure on that thread between those two discs to add tension to your thread and have it be exactly what it needs to be for the stitch you're using, right? So there's a sensor in there that makes this all happen. So this thread sensor that we just showed you, just talked about, is activated by the flag and the check spring. So if you look at the graphic down below, and I just took a um, screenshot of, um, this is a view as you're looking at the front of the machine and your thread, so go with me here for a sec. Your purple thread is threaded, it comes down, comes around the check spring and comes back. And this is the part the left side is the part that's now like down on the bed of your machine, okay? This blue um, piece right here is called the flag. And this, let me get my, this arrow, this little um, wire is called the check spring. So you see, I just popped that. This is called the check spring and this is called the flag, okay? If you are threaded correctly, <clears throat> the flag, this flag moves up and down with every single stitch. And each time it does that, it interrupts a light barrier. Okay, it's not a light we can see, it's, a, it's inside the machine, right? So as it moves up and down with every single stitch, as long as it breaks the light barrier, every single time, all is well. Your machine is stitching just fine, okay? But what if after you thread or cut your thread, the thread is loose and laying on the bed of your machine and your check spring is in the resting position like you see here, okay? <clears throat> what if you have no tension on that thread, you're not holding it, you're not doing anything with it. So what happens is that the machine doesn't realize you've started to sew and the check spring is not triggered because there's no tension on your thread. And then the flag will not move up and down and the and if the flag does not move up and down, it does not break the light barrier, and therefore your um, um, error message is triggered. So let's do that again, different view here. When you start to sew, the needle moves first. Get your foot control, needle moves first. Then after the needle starts to move, the check spring and the flag move together. It's in a sequence, needle first, then flag and check spring. Okay, so if you are not holding onto your thread or it's not being held in a, some kind of way that allows the check spring to be triggered. So right here, there's your check spring. If that is not pulled, if it is not triggered, the flag does not move, check the thread break error happens, okay? 
And that's why if you just touch the X on the screen and continue to sew, it'll be fine. It'll continue to sew just fine. But that first moment, there's a, um, they happen in a sequence. They don't happen all at the same time. And so that's why when I say, said to you earlier today, no jackrabbit starting, this is why. Okay, so you start to sew, hit the foot control, the needle moves first, then the check spring and the flag together. So if you start sewing fast, the flag has not yet moved enough to interrupt the light barrier and the thread break error message is triggered. Okay, that's the mechanical why this is happening to you. And I know we've all experienced it. I surely have as well, okay? But the cool thing is now you know why it's happening. And that's a good thing because now there are solutions, right? So here's how, here are the solutions to this. Start sewing slowly. Don't jackrabbit start. Just tap your foot control, let it do one stitch, hold on to the thread or put your thumb or your hand on top of the thread just to give it a little bit of um, hang on to it kind of mindset to make sure your check spring is triggered. Hold on to the top thread as you begin to sew if you want, or just, I usually just leave it lay on the bed of the machine and then just hold it down with my, with my finger. It doesn't have to be a lot of tension. It's not like you have to pull tension. You just have to have it have a little bit of um, tautness to it so that it will trigger your check spring. The other thing you could do is you could cut the thread on the side of the machine and leave the thread up into the thread cutter because your thread cutter will hold on to it, the one on the side of the machine, and let it stay up there while you begin to sew and it will um, give it just enough hold so that your check spring is not triggered. Isn't that wonderful? Now you know why that's happening to you. It's like, yay, now I know how to solve that, right? So you just have to change your habit a little bit as you be, as you start your sewing. And, and that's not hard. Ready for the next technical question? All right. If you sew a lot with invisible thread, I was reading there was a, that could cause issues. So I went to Alex and I said, so does invisible thread really cause cuts or grooves in the thread path? Answer was yes, it does. If you use invisible thread a lot, doing a lot of machine applique or, or whatever, or quilting even, over time, there's, you know, the time frame is not clear, but over time, you can cause um, grooves or cuts to happen in the thread path as you, um, with that particular kind of thread because of how it's made. So how do you know that that's happening? So my question to Alex was, what are the symptoms of this? If I were you, if this was happening to my machine, how do I know it's happening and how do I get it fixed? So here are your symptoms. The top tension, you'll have start having top tension issues. Your tension seems higher than it used to be. And, um, or your, your uh, bobbin thread is pulling to the top where it didn't do that before, right? Um, when you're threading your machine, the thread seems to get caught or get stuck along the way, like it's not smooth like it was before. That could indicate there's some cuts or grooves happening. Um, if you um, are using cotton thread, these symptoms are more pronounced especially um, if your thread gets caught or stuck because cotton thread would rip along the way. So um, just kind of keep that in mind if you use invisible thread a lot. Here's your solution. The only solution is that the parts would need to be replaced, whatever parts have those grooves or cuts in them because they can't be otherwise smoothed out in any way. But it's good to know that if you use a lot of invisible thread that this could happen. I mean. Seriously, it could take years. I don't, I don't know. I just want you to understand there are symptoms of this, so keep an eye out. Next technical question is the value of using the correct spool pin. So I went to Alex and I said, so, you know, does it really matter 
if I put my thread on the rear spool pin or on the front spool pin, like, does it really matter? And the answer was, yeah, it really does matter. Um, it really will make a difference. So um, the cones and cross wound threads should pull off the top of the spool and the flat wound pulls off the side of the spool. We talked about that this morning a little bit. The reality is that it doesn't always have to be that way. Sometimes you can try it another way. So if your thread is behaving unruly, if it's just not behaving well, if um, it's twisting as it comes off the top of the spool, um, you can always, even though it may be a cross wound thread, you can still try the rear spool pin and thread through the horizontal thread guide to control the thread release off, the, off of the um, spool. And remember this morning we talked about the thread release. So that's, um, it's important to have that be a smooth release. So if you're using a thread that isn't behaving well, whatever type of thread it is, then you know if it's twisting as it comes off or if it's puddling at the bottom of the spool, if it's, particularly if it's puddling, then use the rear spool pin and the horizontal thread guide. Okay. It is a misconception, I mentioned this this morning as well, it is a misconception that all spools of thread of the same thread line will behave in the same way. This is false. Even the color of the thread matters. So if you have a spool that's not behaving well, set it aside, try a different spool. It could be just that spool at that moment with this technique, with that thread, with that fabric. It all has to talk nice together. That's the whole point. Listen to your machine. If it's not behaving well, it's something that you're doing. So make, make it, um, try different things, different size needles, different spool pins to um, get the right mix for the project you're working on. Okay, next technical question was, in embroidery, the machine is not picking up the bobbin thread. Why does this happen? So I went to Alex and I said, Alex, so how come this happens? It even happens to me sometimes. Answer is this, this would happen for two reasons. If you are using a slippery kind of bobbin thread, these slide and may not form the proper loop needed to hook the threads together on the first stitch. So it might not pick up till the second or third stitch. And I always notice this um, particularly, not a lot in embroidery, except whenever I did the basting box, you know, you, you use the basting box whenever you are um, in the embroidery. And sometimes it didn't pick up on that basting box, the first couple stitches. I'm like, why has this happened to me? Um, so probably bobbin thread type was the reason. So of course you can, you know, needle, you can use your needle drop down and up and, um, you know, bring that bobbin thread up to the top so that doesn't happen to you. The other thing is if the lower thread tail is um, too short. So if, you, um, if, if you're using a cotton or a polyester thread in a bobbin, th and this is a repetitive problem for you, then the thread mechanically, here we go again down that tech world, the thread is not being held long enough during the automatic cutting process. And that's a thing that um, your service department at your local dealer would have to have to adjust for you because that thread has to be held taut while the machine is cutting the thread. And if it's a little loose for whatever reason and it lets go of the thread a little bit, then the thread tail would be cut too short and then it wouldn't pick up on your first um, stitch, right? So if you're using a more slippery kind of bobbin thread, um, then it shouldn't happen. Um, it should, it, it would happen because it's slippery, but if you're using a cotton thread or a polyester in the bobbin and it happens often, then you might wanna mention it to the tech in your store. Okay, there's more. Oh, metallic thread breaks. I didn't know this. Metallic threads, some of them are very smooth, but some are rougher or have nubs on them or are, um, you know, just by the way they are made. Um, 
the rougher ones could cause the uh, thread to break during stitching because that roughness kind of gets in the way of the needle and could cause breakage. Some metallic threads are very slippery. Um, metallic threads do have a very high memory, which means that whenever they pull off the spool, they get that additional twist or um, they even kink over on top of each other. That kind of stuff causes an imbalance in the thread delivery, okay? And that thread um, uh, resistance uh, changes because it's twisting as it's coming off. And your stitches will not turn out well if you see that happening. So make sure you pay attention when you're using metallic threads to make sure that the, um, the way the thread is released off of the spool is nice and smooth. You could try using a nine millimeter stitch plate in embroidery to allow more space for the thread to move unimpeded. You know, if it's a thread um, that has um, like a rougher feel to it and you want to, uh, you want to use it anyway because you love that color, that's okay. You might want to use a nine millimeter stitch plate or maybe even a five and a half millimeter stitch plate to give a little more space instead of a single hole that might prevent um, thread breaks from happening. So those are all of the options. Just make sure if you use a different stitch plate, you tell the machine which stitch plate you're using. Um, using a larger needle, uh, even a top stitch 100 could help with these kinds of threads or a thread net might also help. So just pay attention to how it's released off the spool. You don't want it to be, um, you don't want any drag or anything that would make the thread release have extra tension because that would cause um, metallic thread breaks. Um, oh, one more thing about metallic threads. So the arrow in the picture is pointing at that um, part when you open your bobbin door, you all know this part, it kind of helps you with the threading process. This part is called the retainer stopper and it is on the bobbin basket. It affects the flow of the thread around the hook. And so the words I heard were uh, from Alex were, yeah, if there's a nick or a scrape or something on that stopper, I guarantee you, you're gonna have thread problems. So that has to be a nice smooth piece. And so I want you to know that if you are having repetitive metallic thread breaks, run your hand along the bottom of that See if we can feel anything and maybe mention it to the tech as well when you take your machine in for service that the retainer stopper they're going to love it that you're going to know these words guaranteed <laughs> so if it does damaged in any way or has a nick it could cause thread breakage and then you would need to have that piece replaced through your dealer okay buzzing right along here we're going to have some fun now so i am going to switch back and forth between PowerPoint and my Bernina simulator for the 880. And I'm gonna show you some things that um, I don't know if you've seen before, but they, they are really kind of some fun techniques. So um, let me go over here. Hold on, I gotta switch for a second. So if you'll hold on a second. And All right, just wanna make sure we're working okay. All right, so my first slide for this is, you know, you gotta have fun with your 880, right? That's why we have it. So let's go see what we can do. So the first one is uh, that I wanna talk about is called multi-directional sewing. And if any of you have not tried this, oh, please do. It is super fun. It's on the sewing side, not in embroidery. And um, it, it's a, place where you can sew in any direction that you want. So 360 degrees times two, because you can make your stitches move in half degree increments, which is fantastic. Uh, when you choose the icon that you see there on the screen, under your information icon is where you would find it. And you open that up, it, it, comes, um, it comes up and it looks like a compass. And so when you start to sew, um, 
you can use one stitch at a time or you can use this also in combination mode. It works on lots of different stitches. I, I can't guarantee I would say all stitches, but a lot of stitches you can use this multi-directional sewing, which is really kind of fun. So I'm gonna go into simulator. I'm gonna show you a couple of things, but I'll point out here on the screen that tote bag that you see on the upper right-hand corner, it was done with multi-directional sewing. All of that stitching on the front was done with um, this technique. If you would like to try something like that, I gave all the directions. It's on the wealso.com, uh, the Bernina blog. And just in the search um, key area, just type in the word multi-directional and it will, it will bring up this project. Um, the other uh, thing is the little sample that you see at the bottom of the screen was just a little stitch that I took into combination mode and turned it into a multi-directional stitch. So let me show you how this works. This is, you know, just super fun. So simulator. Okay. So um, first we will go to, um, let me go to a decorative stitch. So if I choose stitch 414, and I open my information icon, and I find the multi-directional icon right here, which is the presser foot view with the circle around it, my screen changes into a compass. And so here's how it works. I can tap the screen, and you'll see here on the screen, my stitch has now moved to 225 degrees. So I can tap all these different nodes and it'll move around and it will go that direction, right? So here's the way this works. You get your fabric, you need some stabilizer, especially if you're gonna use it like this, a satin stitch, right? And you hold the fabric square to the table and you don't twist the fabric like a steering wheel, okay? You hold it square to the table because you're turning the stitch not the fabric, okay? So know that you can also use your multifunction knobs to turn that stitch and you can see if you'll look down here, you'll see it's changing 142.5, 143.5, so you can see it just moves by half degree increments. Here's the cool thing. You can turn your multifunction knobs while you sew. I know, right? This is so much fun. If you take this stitch and you turn your knobs while you're sewing it out, then your stitch will, will dance around the fabric, okay? And when I go back to PowerPoint, I'll, that's exactly how I did that, um, that tote bag. So here, there are a couple of um, tips to how this works, okay? So when you use this feature, the stitch maintains its stitch density and how it looks on the, just as you see it on the screen. It doesn't get, you know, skewed in any direction at all. It just moves around and it makes the same exact stitch. If you are sewing and you're moving the direction with your multifunction knobs as you sew, then I want you to sew slower. So turn your speed down and make sure you hold your fabric square to the table. And you can kind of draw in any direction that you want, which is really fun. So the basic rules are hold your fabric square to the table, square to the table, and don't sew real fast, especially if you're making it go in different directions while you sew. And it's just too much fun. Okay. I'm going to show you one more thing here with um, that I mentioned on the PowerPoint. I'm going to go get a different stitch go to combi mode we're going to use this stitch okay so this is just little flower it's number 104 stitch number 104 it's just a little nine millimeter stitch you see it here on the screen right so i'm going to add four of those i have four i open my information icon and i have my multi-directional sewing that i can use now you know there are probably some stitches that it it wouldn't be visible, it would be grayed out, but this stitch, it showed up just fine. So I'm gonna go to my first stitch at the top here, 
and I'm going to make it go that that way. And then this second stitch, I'm going to leave it to go that direction. This third stitch, I'm going to make it go this direction. And the fourth stitch, I'm going to make it go this direction. So now you can see I've taken four little stitches and changed them all into one combi stitch. And it stitches out so nice. Um, just um, there are just so many different ways that you can use this multi directional sewing to enhance your projects. There's always something fun you can add to a project. So, just another mention see how these stitches are moving um, on the tote bag. You can see how they're moving around um, and circling. And I did not turn the fabric. That was with multi directional sewing. And I just turned the stitch the way I wanted it to go. And then this is that um, other little stitch number 104 that was created. But, so I want you to experience your 880. I want you to use it as um, to its fullest, really. So our next um, lesson is on connecting stitches. In this lesson, we combine stitches and then change them from a standard nine millimeter to a sideways motion. Now this is a little different than just using it as a, as a, um, as a combi stitch and the multi-directional. Different process, but it really is, um, it, 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 you may find it more useful for different techniques. So I usually um, show this with this particular stitch that you see on the screen, and then I take it into con connecting stitches and move it so now it's a sideways motion stitch. It's no longer nine millimeters wide. It's nine, eight, um, almost 18, maybe 16 wide. And then when you stitch it out, it kind of looks like that. And this was actually using a twin needle. So um, I use a 2.0 twin needle with two colors of thread to stitch that out. So let's see, let me go back one. Um, let me switch to simulator. I'll show you how that works. Okay, so, <clears throat> so here I am in combination mode. And when I do uh, connecting stitches, I do have to be in combination mode. But I have to get rid of this stitch first. So I'm going to go back into my information. And I'm going to select everything on the screen here. And then I'm going to touch the garbage can and say, OK, I do want to get rid of that because it will always ask you to confirm before it actually throws something away. So now I'm going to close this box at the top right. And we're going to go to Decker's stitch folder. I'm going to fly the screen out because it's easier for me to find. I'm going to use folder 601 and stitch number 656. I'm going to do it twice. So you notice when you fly the screen out that your stitches land um, horizontally across the top. So just a little tip that if you're ever doing like uh, sewing out words on a, on a project, if you fly the screen out, it's much easier to see it that way. OK, so here I am. And I am on uh, the second of my stitches. And you'll see down here at the bottom, you have a, a little button that has double arrows. This double arrow is like an expand of the screen kind of mindset. So when I tap it, my screen changes. And now I have on the left is a preview screen that I can see this is how this stitch is going to turn out. And then I have my two stitches that I had. And they're blown up big. So now I can really see what's going on. So the first thing you do is I, um, so when you're on an actual machine, not on a simulator, you just tap the stitch and drag and drop it. So on a, on a computer, it takes me a couple of times to drag and drop it over. And then you can also use your multifunction knobs to move it where you want. So let's say I want it right there. Okay, so as you can see, it's now um, on the left hand side, it's now a um, sideways motion stitch. So here's the cool thing. 
this actually makes your machine dance. It is so fun to watch. I encourage you to try this. Um, it will stitch the first stitch and then it will just dance like this and stitch the second one. And then it will dance back and stitch the first one again. It's, it's really a nice way to add decorative stitches to your projects. So you're probably gonna say to me, well, Debbie, I'm just not sure that those stitches are very connected. Look at those, those are like separated here in pairs. Yes, yes, they are. But because you're here today, I'm gonna to show you how to match them up perfect. So this is a little bit of a process. It's not hard, it's procedural. So here's the procedure. The first thing you do is you tap the stitch at the top to turn it blue. Then you open the information icon on this screen and you select this icon right here that's called move multiples. So now both stitches are blue. Then you go to your multifunction knob at the bottom and you turn it clockwise and watch your preview screen and you can see your stitches move so that they will match up perfectly. So you just stop whenever you can see that they're where you want. Then you close this uh, expanded view and now you have the first stitch. The machine will dance to the left and do the second one and then dance to the right and do the first one again. So now you'll notice in, in the middle of the screen, you'll see these crosshairs. Those are the connecting stitches. Those are a jump stitch that connects from one to the next. Okay, so um, those in this particular stitch, um, those will be buried within the stitching of itself. So you don't have to worry about trimming or cutting those stitches. So depending on what stitch you use and how you move them, the further apart you move those stitches from each other, the larger that jump stitch is going to be. So you have to think about how you want that to look, okay? All right, so that is connecting stitches, which by the way, is a lot of fun and it's really easy to do. You can even save your stitches in there in your personal program if you do those sorts of things. Okay. Our next one is called the balance function. So a lot of people don't know how this works. So I thought I would just toss this in here for those of you that have experienced um, in challenges with this. So this um, is a feature that's on all of our touchscreen machines. And the way it works is it allows the machine to adjust the stitch to fit the fabric on which you are sewing. So here's the way it works, and I'll go back to the simulator and show you. So the easiest way I could show this is using this. Um, this is stitch number 10 that you see on the screen. It is a, um, it's called the overlock stitch that you can use to kind of, if you don't have an overlock or a serger, then you can use it to finish an edge to kind of corral any, you know, unruly threads hanging off the edge, trim it, and then do this stitch on the edge because it has a straight stitch in the fabric and a straight stitch on the edge of the fabric and then a zigzag between to kind of corral them. So the way it works is <clears throat> when you open the balance function, you do it, first thing you do is you do a test sew. So here's a picture of my test sew. This is a piece of uh, denim and I did the testing and you can see how the, this stitch line should be on the edge of the fabric, not on the front side of the fabric. It's not, um, doesn't look quite right. See, it's separated here and here. It just isn't exactly like perfect, right? You want it to be perfect, don't we all? Aren't we all like that? So yes. So when you use the balance function, and I'll go to simulator and show you that. So you can see the arrows are pointing to the, the bad parts of that. Then we go over here to the after I fixed the balance, after I adjusted using the balance function. Whoops, wrong one. Um, you can see how um, it looks perfect over here. Everything matched up just perfect. And that's the look you want whenever you do um, that particular stitch. So let me show you on the simulator how it works. It's really pretty easy. Um, but our machines really have a lot of features like this. So this is great. Let me 
go out of combination. And I need to go get stitch number 10. Okay, so here we are with stitch number 10. And all I do is go into, so first thing you do is you take your fabric and you do a test sew on an edge. Because you don't know if you need to do this balance, um, adjusting the balance. It all depends on fabric needle thread. What are you using? And how is the machine feeding that through? How is that going to work, right? So if you see something like what you saw on my screen, then go into information and touch the balance key right here. Then this picture comes up, right? And all you do is you turn either your um, upper or lower multifunction knob, and you can also use the plus minus, and you want this picture on your, on the, in the balance view to look like the fabric that you tested. You want it to look whatever you stitched out and it's not quite right. You want this picture to look like that. So let's say I moved it. Nope, oh, that's not the one. Maybe I moved it this way. Nope. Oh. Okay, so here's the view I want. So now I'm looking at it and I'm going, okay, so, so this is the view I had on mine, right? It was separated here and pulled funny. So I thought, okay, well, that will probably work. So you change this picture to look like your fabric and then you do another test sew and it will look perfect because the machine knows how to adjust for the fabric that you're using. All you have to do is tell it what to do. There you go. Pretty good, right? Isn't that easy? All right, let me switch back. Okay, the next thing I wanna show you are taper stitches. So our 880 um, and the 830, um, they have a menu in the sewing side that are taper stitches, which is, you know, what do I do with this, right? So I, um, it's folder number 1401 on our machines and um, when you choose a taper stitch, it looks like the picture you see on the screen and you can adjust the taper point in so many ways I can't even begin to tell you. It's so much fun. Um, it, I, you know, taper stitches to me, like when I originally started playing with these, I, you know, I looked at those and I thought those are like for machine applique, right? If you were machine applique something that's square or rectangle um, that you could, it would taper right to the point, it would stop at the end of the point, then you just lift the foot, turn the fabric, and it will go the way that you want it to go. And that's like the traditional way we use things. I don't usually use things traditional. So let me show you um, on the simulator again. Okay, so the first thing you do is you go get um, the folder 1401. These, all of these in here are taper stitches. They're all very different, very unique, um, and they all have a point at the top and the point of, at the bottom. So let me show you how they work. I'm gonna pull up 14, um, hold on. 1440, there it is. Okay, so when you open a taper stitch, you have this um, bar down the middle. If you, and the, these stitches are come to you in three parts. There's the top portion that you see blue here. There's the middle portion that is kind of the body of the stitch. And then the bottom one is the bottom point portion, okay? so. If you open your information icon, we need to find out a little bit more about this stitch. So these are always pattern repeat of one. Uh, you can do more. Um, there is a mirror image option. There is a balance function option. But the one we wanna talk about is this, um, um, this is the size of the stitch. The length of the stitch from point to point is 69 millimeters. Okay, so 69 millimeters is about two and a half inches long, about um, 20, 
five millimeters is about an inch. Okay, so that's kind of your measurement there. So what if you want to make this longer? So what happens is the middle portion, the body of the stitch elongates the full body as a full repeat. So if I wanna make it longer, that portion, now the whole stitch is now 92 millimeters long because it's a full repeat of the center body. So the center body was around 20 millimeters about long. So it just drops another 20 millimeters so that it all looks perfect, right? So just so you know how that works. The other thing I wanna show you, if I um, scroll up here a little bit, there's a um, icon down here at the bottom with these four icons on it. And you look at that and go, well, what does that do? Well, I'm gonna show you. So this is where you can change how the point of the taper stitch um, looks. So the default one is this um, top one. It's a taper configuration and it's at the center of the, of the stitch. If I select this one, second one down, you can see how the point moves to the left side and slants down to the right. If I choose the next one down, then it slants the opposite direction. This one, it kind of is, um, it starts on the left, but it's a more flat looking um, point rather than a, um, a more pointed one. So the funny thing is that, um, you know, depending on what you're stitching around determines which point you might need to use. So that's how you decide. You have to test though, right? That's how we know what to do. And so you can test sew those out to find out. You can also, of course, um, you know, you do have what we call total stitch control in Bernina world. You can change almost anything on any stitch. All you have to do is try and see if you like it, test it out, see if it stitches the way you want it to. But of course you can change the stitch width here, okay? So there's also a manual function here at the bottom. And this is the one I wanna show you because I just think it's fun. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so if you select the manual function, it gives you these two boxes, right? This one changes the width of the point. This one changes um, the width of the, um, the body of the point. It, both of these affect the point, right? So let's say I want to change this one. You can see how you can fine tune, totally control where you want that point to land because maybe you're doing something that's an odd shape and you just need it to be exactly where you want it to be. And this is how you do it. This one at the bottom, you can change. It actually, if you watch the stitch on the screen, you can see how it changes the whole, the whole point from left to right, right? It doesn't move the point left to right, it shapes the whole point all the way down into the stitch, which is really kind of a wild idea, isn't it? And that's why whenever I uh, go back to my PowerPoint, I do have on my screen that I actually stitched this out with that really narrow point just because I could, because it's fun, because I wanted to see what it would look like. And then once I see it stitched out, then I can decide, well, maybe I will use that somewhere. So I just have to, you have to stitch it out to know. Okay, so there's one more thing I want to show you here since I'm on this um, page. I am going to change my stitch width of this stitch down to around six, okay? And I am going to switch to embroidery. So on our main embroidery screen, we have our heart folder, our my designs folder. When you have a stitch on your sewing screen and you switch over to embroidery, that stitch is at the top left of your my designs folder. So the same is true if you had a straight stitch on your sewing side and you switched over to embroidery, there would be a straight stitch here. And I'll bet you've wondered why is there a straight stitch there? That's why, because you have the option to 
use that stitch. It's a it's there for you to use now. If you switch back to sewing and did something else and switch back to embroidery, this one would be gone. It's kind of like a temporary placehold, right? So let's say we choose that stitch. Okay, here's what I love about this idea. If I want to use Deco stitches over on my embroidery side, I have the ability to take any, any decorative stitch from the sewing side, work with it on the sewing side to be the exact size that I want it to be. Because total stitch control is really detailed on the sewing side. I can make this narrower and wider here on the embroidery side too. But on the sewing side, I really can see exactly how things would look. Then when I bring it over to embroidery, it's exactly what I need it to be. So let's say I want to do, um, I'm going to show you this. I'm ahead of myself, FYI. I'm pretty sure <laughs> on my PowerPoint, but we'll get there. Um, so here's my stitch. I have selected the jumbo hoop. Okay. Let's say I want to make this stitch into a an embroidery design. Okay. Not just one stitch, but many. So if I open my information icon, I like to use the shape designer. Have you any any of you used your shape designer? It is so much fun. You get so so totally lost in here. It's amazing. So you can open your shape designer. And when this field opens, you have ways that you can change what you see on the screen. So this is your preview screen here. Okay. There are seven or nine, maybe nine different shapes. I can put this one stitch on the shape. So I'm going to choose the circle. And here's how many repeats of this stitch do I want on the circle. So I can go in here and I'm going to make six stitches. This bank of buttons here, all of these, are your um, sizing. So this one is the width of the circle, okay, the shape. This is the height of the shape. So if I want this circle to now be an oval, I would need to unlock those two from each other so that I can move them independent of each other. I'm gonna leave them locked together and I'm going to change this into a star because goodness knows, it's just, life's too short not to have this much fun. So there are plus um, 90 degrees, so that's four positions that you can rotate the design. Each will rotate 90. It won't matter in this particular one, but I'll show you some more in a bit. And this one is a mirror image, also doesn't matter in this particular design. So if I touch the green check mark here, I now have my star made from my stitch that I fine tune with, you know, the ability to make it exactly what I want on the sewing side with total stitch control. So now I have this star, but you know, there's funner stuff out there than just one star. Don't we need more than one star? So I'm gonna go back into Shape Designer and I'm gonna add more. And I'm gonna make that smaller. So now I have an entire bunch of stars all together. So there are so many things you can create in embroidery from the sewing side that I encourage you to push the edges, try things. The worst that can happen is the machine goes, ah, I don't think I can do that, but surely you should try, right? So this, this kind of stuff is a lot of fun and that was just using one taper stitch. So let me go back to, um, you know what? I, and go back to PowerPoint. Okay, so uh, now back on PowerPoint, you can see over here on the right-hand side that I did stitch out that taper stitch while making those points just ridiculously pointy. I haven't quite figured out what I'm gonna do with that, but I will come up with something that I think will be kind of fun. So um, this is what we've, just finished talking about taking your altered decorative stitches to embroidery from the sewing side. And this is the demo I just showed you. This is exactly what we did. Um, you change your stitch on the sewing side, select your home key, switch to embroidery, select your My Motifs folder to find your altered stitch, 
and select it to open it in the hoop, right? So on the right-hand side, you'll see a stitch out. And I do apologize for the not great photo there. It looked fine in my camera. And then when I dropped it into the PowerPoint, it all got kind of wonky. I don't really know why that happened, but I wasn't able to fix it. But what I did was I took that star pattern that I made um, in the simulator and I, I overlaid it twice. So you can see there's a gray stitch out and a red. So I'm gonna switch back over because I, I wanna show you that. Oh my gosh, we're running out of time already. You don't mind, do you? All right, so here we go. I decided that what I would do was I would go over here and I would take my color palette and I would um, pick a different color so I could see it better. And then I went to um, information and I duplicated it. And I took that second layer and I moved it to the side. And you can see the other one coming from underneath and I moved it down a little bit. So now I have two, but you know, I don't want two of them to be, you know, that color. I'm gonna pick a different color for the second one. And just so you can see how that works, right? That you can create a design from one stitch in Shape Designer and then, you know, take it to another level and duplicate it or, you know, rotate it or do something that you like because this is really all about you. This machine is so amazing. You need to really experience all the different parts. So, um, Connecting stitches you can take to embroidery as well. Um, and that was the uh, combi stitch that I showed you. And you can take that kind of stitch and move it over to the embroidery machine. And then when you do that, this is that same exact stitch, only I stitched it on um, black and red silk. And I used a twin needle to embroider it. So, you can create your own printed fabric by solids print with your thread. So um, you can select the exact needle, the exact twin needle you may want to stitch with. Also know that if you are doing twin needle embroidery, you cannot use, and I didn't write this on the screen, so you'll have to take a note here, You'll need to use a nine millimeter stitch plate, not a um, single hole stitch plate. And I, I like to use a 2.0 twin needle because that's just the two millimeters between each, between the two needles and that's far enough apart for me, but surely you're welcome to try other sizes if you prefer, but you would need to use an embroidery foot number 15, or you could use the cut work foot number 43 you cannot use the regular embroidery foot number 26 because that is for a single needle, not a twin and not a twin wing and not a wing. It's only for just a single uh, needle. So when you embroider with a twin needle or anytime you're using a twin needle, you need to sew at a slower speed because you have to allow your machine to make a zigzag between the two needles as you sew. And if you sew too fast, I guarantee you, you will break your needle. And they're not the cheapest needles. So make sure that whenever you're using a twin needle of any kind or a triple needle, any of those specialty needles, do not sew fast because it will cause you to break a needle. It just, it's not the machine. It's just the way mechanically a stitch is formed. So if you are using a twin needle, a triple needle, any of those, so when you thread your machine, you put your thread on the thread spools like usual. You thread one thread, your first thread, through the needle, all the way through the needle. Make sure you tell the machine you're using a twin needle or use the hand threader button on the screen and thread the needle by hand. It does not matter if you thread the left one or the right one first, it makes absolutely no difference. So what you see on the screen is kind of the top of your machine where, you know, um, we always we always notice that little tab that's kind of in the thread path at the top of the machine above the screen. 
So when you use a twin needle and you're using two threads, you want to put the thread, the first thread behind or in front of, and the second thread the opposite when you thread in front or behind this tab. So this tab is simply a separator. That's all it does. It separates the thread path when you're using two threads. So I normally would thread my machine, I'd curl the thread up, I'd lay it on the top of the machine, I'd slide it behind this little tab, bring it down, thread the first side of the needle. Then when I thread my second spool for my twin needle, I bring it up into the threader and I bring it now to the front of this little tab, okay? So that the threads are separated from each other, otherwise they may twist and break. So one in front, one behind, hand thread the needles, okay? If you're using a triple needle, pick a side. It just, it, there's only two thread paths up there. So that's the way it works. And then I just dropped this picture of the hand threading button on the head of the machine again to make sure you know where that is. Because if you don't tell your machine that you're using a specialty needle before you thread, it, you can't tell it. You have to tell the machine here on the screen um, to, that you're gonna hand thread. Otherwise it'll crash into your needles and it'll break them. So always remember that. Okay, I talked about shape designer and embroidery already, but I'll do one more demo. I know we're out of time, but I'm gonna keep going. Sorry, Randy. Um, we're, this, is, uh, this is a really fun uh, thing to do. And the last time I did it, I used a um, decorative stitch. So this time, I'm just going to use a regular embroidery design. And let me go to uh, go get something new. And I'm going to pull. Um, all right, let's pull. Let's go here. I'll pull that design that was there. So this design is a um, kind of looks like a wave to me. Um, and I did stitch this out one time. It's really quite a beautiful design. But if you take this to Shape Designer, so you can take almost any stitch, any design into Shape Designer, even um, question marks and alphabets and just, you know, you can try anything. I did buttonholes in here. I mean, just it's amazing the things you can create from other things if you just try them out. So I encourage you to try anything and bring it in here. Here's the hardest part about Shape Designer, seriously, is that once you get something that you like, you can't remember what you did to get there because you can make so many changes along the way. So kind of pay attention when you start working it, right? So if I put, let's say, eight designs on this circle and I bring my circle in, so now my hoop is not red, so it'll fit you know, within the hoop frame. Um, then you can use your plus 90 and turn all those designs the way you want. You can even mirror image them, which some designs don't look right that way. Um, I would also consider unlocking uh, the uh, width from the height and making the width smaller so you can make this into an oval from a circle. So there, there are really um, um, lots of really interesting things you can do with all different kinds of stitches. Let's see, what do I have left here? Um, oh, um, this is just, a, um, I dropped some pictures. We'll just show you some of the pictures this time. This is a question mark. In embroidery, you know, in the font section, you have the anniversary font, I think it's called anniversary, that is like that script look, which is really very pretty, right? So I took that script, um, alphabet font, and I chose just a question mark, one question mark. I took it into Shape Designer, and I put eight repeats, and I decreased the size, so now I have a flower. And then I um, touched the green check mark button, so I went back to my edit screen, and then I thought, oh, but maybe I want more than one. So then I did Shape Designer a second time, and this time I added six of the flowers that I created from a question mark and just brought the size down so it looks 
kind of like that, and then just hit your green check mark button at that point. And now you have a whole design that almost fills the jumbo hoop. So um, do not limit yourself. Shape designer is a lot of fun. Um, I just want to say a note about the new smart drive technology for uh, the new embroidery module that's out there. It is faster, it is quieter, and it's available at your local dealer. And I'm hearing rumors that a lot of them are doing a trade-in, like you could bring in your old module and trade it in for this one. I don't know if everybody does that, but you could try that. Okay, in summary, learn how to sew perfect with your 880. Use the tools at hand. Make sure that you hang on to that thread or put it up in the thread cutter so that it doesn't, um, so that it triggers your check spring and your flag so that you never get that um, error message again. Process is key to success. This machine is not like other brands. It's not like other Bernina machines. The tension, the top tension mechanism is different. Everything's different here. So don't expect it to behave like some other machine. This one is different, and all you have to do is learn the process. It's not difficult, it's procedural. Do it the way I tell you to do it. Um, I would suggest that you might wanna watch last year's webinars that I did. They're on YouTube um, or on Bernina.com uh, for threading correctly. That uh, There were four of those, they were called Embrace the Rhythm of Your 880. I also will mention, um, must be two years ago now, I did a, two, a series of two webinars that were called, um, shoot, what were they called? Understanding a stitch, part one and part two. So if you're not, if you don't understand how a stitch is actually created, all the different things that happen along the way that are in your control, to make sure that you thread your machine correctly and that your machine sews correctly, you have to understand how all those things work together. It's really kind of amazing that we can sew 1,200 stitches per minute on our 880 and all the moving parts that happen in the creation of just one of those 1,200 stitches. So that one is called Understanding a Stitch, part one and part two. It'll teach you how to, how to understand what's going on. Um, always think about thread release. So whenever you are threading your 880, think about how that thread is coming off the machine. As you're sewing, take a look at what's happening over there. If you see things twisting or, you know, wrapping up around the thread guides, then you need to find a, you need to use a different method. You need to put it on the rear spool pin and use the horizontal thread guide because you have to understand what is causing that, res that um, resistance to the release of the thread. So work with your machine and it will behave much better. Give your flag and your check spring the time to perform correctly. No jackrabbit starting anymore. And enjoy your 880. And I hope you absolutely love it because I surely do. So, Randy, we probably don't have time for too many questions. Do you see anything that we need to answer? Um, since we're out of time, uh, <clears throat> I am just going to forward all of these questions. Uh, I am going to email them to you. Um, okay. So, you know. Uh, I, will, I will answer them. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Please know they, they won't be answered probably in the next month or so. We have. <laughs> <laughs> some conference coming up, so um, give me some time, and um, I, I will I will get I will get through them. So um, are we good? Um, yeah. the, okay. Thank you, Randy. Thank you. Thank um, you. Background. Thank you for helping. Um, I appreciate all of you that have an 880, and um, um, I I hope you love it. Good to go. Yep. All right. Bye, everybody.